Management Associates is a boutique agency that provides consultation and capacity building support with stakeholder and community engaged initiatives. Our team consists of innovative and strategic thinkers who are not afraid to challenge traditional methods and ideologies when it comes to being socially uh, responsible um, for the, uh, um, excuse me, when it comes to being um, responsible uh, for our clients' reputation and helping them to um, improve the lives of others. And for more information about our services, please visit causeengagement.com. After the completion of this webinar, um, visit our website and click on the webinars tab to complete the brief evaluation survey, which is located at the bottom of the webinars page. And if you are seeking CHES credit, you must attend this live webinar and complete the entire survey uh, in order to receive credit and a certificate of attendance. And the survey link will also be emailed to all attendees after the completion of this webinar. And what we'll do um, as far as Q&A, if you could please submit your questions throughout the presentation, and then after Dr. Madison will address your questions then. And um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to, introduce you all to the public health pharmacist, Dr. Christina Madison. In addition to serving as an associate professor of pharmacy practice with Roseman University, uh, uh, um, excuse me, in addition to serving as an associate professor of pharmacy practice with Roseman University Health Sciences, Dr. Madison is also a value creator. She's an educator, motivator, media contributor, and author. 12 of her 15 years of pharmacy experience has been specifically in the area of public health. And Dr. Madison provides patient care at two clinical settings. One, the Huntridge Family Clinic, which focuses on the LGBT community and is one of the largest providers of HIV, pre HIV prevention and gender affirming care services in the state of Nevada. And two, Volunteers in Medicine of Southern Nevada, where she offers immunization and communicable disease care. Dr. Madison, thank you for agreeing to share your experience and your expertise regarding the evolving role of pharmacists in public health. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys. And we have, as of now, we have 32 participants. Wonderful. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So, the learning outcomes for today's presentation are to discuss the role of pharmacists in public health and really uh, from my standpoint is to advocate to all of our participants that uh, even though we have so uh, quote unquote traditional roles of what we typically think of when we think about pharmacists working in public health, I want um, you guys to understand that pretty much what we do on a daily basis, even at the community pharmacy setting, it meets the criteria for public health. We're also gonna talk specifically about interventions that can help to decrease the incidence of communicable disease and, and address health disparities in vulnerable populations, as well as look at some best practices for providing culturally competent care, specifically to those who identify in the LGBTQ space, as well as some harm reduction strategies, which include HIV prevention services. And then last but not least, we're gonna talk about why pharmacists need to have provider status in order to uh, improve the health and wellness of their communities and to advance the profession in order to uh, really practice at our scope and expertise. All right, so I borrowed this graphic from someone I follow on Instagram, but I thought it was pretty uh, poignant. Um, so I think in general, there is a, a sense that pharmacists just, you know, lick, stick, and pour, right? We, we have our job behind the counter, and that's pretty much it. But if you take a look at this graphic, it shows you that there are a lot of different roles that pharmacists can play. Uh, for the purposes for, of this presentation, I'm going to focus on public health which you can see here, but there are very uh, diverse avenues that pharmacists can practice in um, at their level of expertise. So what is public health? I tell my students this all the time. So public health is the health of the many versus the health of the one. 
So it deals with the health and wellness of your population as a whole, and it's distinguished from clinic medicine because of its an emphasis on preventing communicable diseases rather than curing a disease in an individual person. And that focus on the population and the community rather than the individual is key because when we focus on public health, we help everyone, not just the one patient that we're treating at a time. So the 10 essentials to public health. Ultimately, we want to monitor the health status of our community and to solve their healthcare needs. We want to diagnose and investigate any health related problems or health hazards in our community. Um, first and foremost, of course, is to inform and educate regarding public health concerns and to mobilize our community partners to identify and solve these problems. We want to develop policies and plans to support individuals and community health efforts, enforce laws and regulations in addition to um, if we don't see laws and regulations that promote public health to actually initiate those, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, later on in the presentation. We also want to make sure that we're linking people to care um, so that they can access those personal health services, uh, and we want to empower um, a competent uh, health workforce, evaluate efficacy, accessibility, and the quality of personal and population-based health. And last but not least, we want to research any new insights and innovations for solving health-related problems in our communities. So I just wanted to take a moment to talk about what we consider to be more traditional roles when we think about pharmacists in public health. Um, so the U.S. Public Health Services pharmacist um, could be enlisted um, as a commissioned uh, officer within the Department of Health and Human Services, and this is, um, they can work within uh, other federal agencies, but in particular, they uh, the public health pharmacist um, will work within the confines of the federal government. So they care for patients, they review, approve, uh, and monitor new drugs, they conduct research, and then they assist um, when there's a public health emergency. We also have pharmacists that work in Indian Health Services, and this is actually really where we saw the birth of clinical pharmacy services because of the autonomy and um, the difference between the legislative and uh, regulatory issues within the federal system versus at the state level. Um, so I practiced at and completed my residency at a VA, um, which did lots of clinical pharmacy services and a uh, majority of the primary care was pharmacist-led clinics. So um, Indian Health Services um, I, is near and dear to my heart. I, I practiced in, in New Mexico, which has lots of rural areas, and uh, pharmacists that work in IHS provide amazing care in those rural areas where uh, a physician um, is not easily accessible. So. Um, in this instance, they have really pioneered innovative practices in order to reach their population that's most vulnerable. Um, so they provide a variety of services, including laboratory monitoring and results, immunizations. Um, they assess uh, their past medical history and provide appropriate drug therapy and continued disease state and therapeutic management. Um, the last role that is more of a traditional role when we think of a public health pharmacist would be um, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. So um, these pharmacists provide care to over 180,000 uh, inmates um, across 122 institutions in the country, and their goal is to improve patient outcomes, control costs, and maintain safety of um, those individuals that they treat that are within the Bureau of Prisons. So they work very closely with physicians and have the freedom to manage um, and do a lot of medication um, and chronic disease uh, management within the prison population. So in 2014, the CDC published this guide for public health um, as it relates to pharmacist partnering uh, with uh, chronic disease management. So if we take a look at this guide, it really was the first of its kind to specifically address the role of a pharmacist in public health that wasn't specific just to disaster preparedness. Um, and so there is a, a, a guideline um, that was endorsed by a majority of the major 
uh, pharmacy national organizations called a pharmacist guide to pandemic preparedness, but it really didn't look at some of the other potential roles that pharmacists could play within public health. So the guide really talks about sort of the definitions of how um, pharmacists can partner within public health in order to manage patients through uh, either MTM services, comprehensive medication management, or collaborative drug therapeutic management. Um, really talks about team-based healthcare, um, maximizing an evidence-based approach, and uh, really looking at policies and procedures at the federal and state level to allow pharmacists to really uh, practice at their level and their scope of expertise. So the guide uh, talked about different areas that pharmacists can impact public health. Uh, obviously the main one, and most of us have probably experienced this, um, 10 years ago, um, it probably would have been uh, very rare for you to receive your influenza vaccination at a pharmacy versus at your doctor's office. Uh, now look at that today, a majority of patients are accessing the pharmacy setting for pretty much all their vaccination needs. Um, and then what my focus is and what I want to uh, enlighten the participants to today is that we should be looking at um, the pharmacist's role in treatment and management of communicable illnesses, specifically the role in sexual health, um, as well as tuberculosis, and then harm reduction strategies, um, such as um, offering needle exchange, um, medication-assisted treatment for those suffering from substance use disorders, um, providing naloxone, which is a reversal agent for opioids, as well as providing condoms. And then um, some additional pu public health roles could be um, looking at global health implications um, for those who maybe want to look into completing a medical mission, uh, the disaster preparedness component, which I mentioned earlier, as well as chronic disease management, screening and edu education, and then participating in patient case preventable co communicable disease education um, information in the community, and then last but not least, counseling our patients on appropriate medication management and following up for adherence. So let's talk a little bit about caring for our vulnerable populations, specifically those who identify in the LGBTQ space. So uh, the definition of LGBTQ is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer community. Um, and it's a very diverse patient population. I think even more so now um, than in the past, uh, it's imperative that we start incorporating some of these best practices into our allied health professional education. Um, I had the wonderful opportunity to start an advanced pharmacy practice experience specifically in a clinic that focuses on the LGBTQ community as well as incorporate LGBTQ care into our pharmacy curriculum last year as part of our men's and women's health block. So uh, given the fact that even more so now with uh, our current uh, younger generation, um, you know, issues of sexual identity as well as gender fluidity um, are very much within our current uh, social diaspora and uh, need to be addressed in a culturally competent way. So our LGBTQ persons come from all walks of life, including people of all races and ethnicities, ages and socioeconomic status, and they're from all parts of the United States. So that need for culturally competent medica medication and medical care, um, as well as preventative care services, um, are very specific to this population because of the health disparities that impact them. So there is a difference in sexual uh, behavior, which accounts for some of these disparities, as well as the social and structural inequities um, that uh, really are important to this population due to stigma and discrimination. Um, and discrimination in general is very common in the LGBTQ community and they're often targeted um, for violence and, and potentially hate crimes. So the perspectives and needs of the LGBTQ community should be considered in public health efforts to improve patient outcomes and to eliminate these health disparities. And the population um, in general is associated with poor, poorer uh, health status um, a lot of times because of uh, mistrust of the traditional healthcare system and um, not wanting to access those traditional um, means because they feel like 
um, they will be potentially discriminated against or judged just based on their sexual orientation or how they uh, want to gender identify in comparison to their uh, heterosexual counterparts. Uh, so understanding these health disparities is really imperative to allowing patients to feel comfortable with their providers. And when we have that safe space for our patients, it really allows for them to have an open and honest conversation with us in order to best establish their risk and provide them with the best patient care possible. So if we take a look at um, our stigma, discrimination, and health. So stigma and discrimination leads to chronic and acute stress, which impacts our, our individual's mental health, their physical health, their access to care, as well as their access to competent care because of mistrust of the system and lack of education of our healthcare providers. And in turn, this all leads to health disparities and inequities. So when we talk about those health disparities specifically that impact the LGBTQ community, we're talking about increases in anxiety, depression, um, increased risk of HIV acquisition as well as sexually transmitted infections. They have a higher rate of homelessness, lack of peer and family support. They're more likely to um, smoke or have substance use, and they are more likely to have suicidal ideations and attempts and specifically in the trans population, um, those attempts um, are uh, potentially more successful. So there is a difference between sexual orientation and gender identity, and they are often um, sort of lumped together when we talk about the differences uh, with these uh, gender and um, uh, sexual orientation minorities. So how someone identifies can change. Um, and as I mentioned, it could be fluid and the terminology may vary. So it's always best to just ask. So typically when I'm introducing myself to a new patient, I tell them what my preferred pronouns are. So those are she, her, and hers, and I'm a cisgender heterosexual um, female. So um, gender identity and sexual orientation are separate com uh, concepts and should not be um, uh, uh, equated or um, interchangeable. So I really love this graphic because it does a great job of illustrating the fact that things are different and things can be fluid. So this is my gender bred person. So how we express ourselves, um, our outward appearance and how we wanna be identified um, by the world is our gender expression. This is different from how uh, our uh, sex assigned at birth uh, potentially could be. Um, my gender identity, sexual orientation are all congruent, but that may not be the case for someone else. So my gender identity is really how I feel, which is different from who I may be attracted to, which is also different from the sex I may be assigned at birth and potentially different from how I express myself onto the world. So I'll give you a for instance. Um, I have a patient who is a transgender female who considers themselves to be heterosexual because they are attracted to men. So their gender expression is different from what their sex assigned at birth was. Um, that's why they consider themselves to be a, a transgender female, but their, uh, their sexual orientation is heterosexual because they're attracted to men based on their gender expression. So as I mentioned before, there could be some overlap um, but sexual orientation is how a person categorizes their physical and emotional attraction to others. So your identity, so do you consider yourself gay, lesbian, bisexual, straight, queer, or something else versus your behavior? So what genders do you have sex with? And who are you attracted to? So what gender are you attracted to? So as you can see, these things can kind of overlap but really are separate concepts. And so that's why it's so important to make sure that you're addressing this, especially, especially when you're conducting a sexual history. 
So terminology within the LGBTQ community is really important, uh, especially when we come uh, to a potential issue of possibly misgendering the patient or not utilizing their preferred name. So you always wanna ask, never assume um, that you're providing uh, the patient with the appropriate pronouns or their preferred name. So that's why I always like to start off the conversation with what my preferred pronouns are, and then that opens the space for them to tell you how they wanna be identified. <coughs> Excuse me. I once had a patient uh, who was in the midst of an active cardiac event who we sent to the emergency room who left uh, AMA against medical advice because the emergency room attending refused to call them by their preferred name and continued to misgender them. So please do not discount that this is just a slip of the tongue. Uh, every time you do this, it's a potential microaggression to that particular person and directly impacts their ability to take recommendations from a healthcare provider. So as I mentioned before, pronouns are very important. These are some examples of appropriate pronouns. So as far as educational resources for the LGBTQ community, the Joint Commission um, has provided um, an advanced uh, effective communication tool specifically for those who want to provide care to the LGBTQ community. This was also published in 2014. The Fenway Institute is an amazing educational resource um, I would also highly recommend, they have lots of learning modules um, for those individuals who uh, you may come encounter with that identify in the LGBTQ space. All right, so now that we've talked a little bit about uh, vulnerable populations, specifically the LGBTQ population, let's talk a little bit about gender-based health, um, specifically in relation to sexual health. So STD and HIV prevention is a passion of mine and it's very close to my heart. And so I am really excited to see uh, the progress that has been made just in the last couple years, uh, really allowing for pharmacists to flourish within this construct and to provide um, additional care and resources and access to STD and HIV prevention strategies for patients who are at most need. So knowing risk is the most essential part in providing HIV and STD prevention strategies. So I always say it's not just who you are, right? Your race, your age, your ethnicity, and who you love, but it's also where, you're, where you live. So that community um, uh, viral load or STD prevalence is really important. So I'll just take where I live for instance, so I live and work in Nevada, specifically in the Las Vegas metropolitan area, which is part of Clark County. And we've been identified as one of the 48 target uh, population counties by the CDC because of our increased rates of STDs and HIV acquisition. So, um, so if you were to be living and dating in Nevada, specifically in Clark County, your risk would be much different than say somewhere in like rural Iowa. So you always wanna talk about correct and consistent condom use because um, you may not realize this, but there are uh, several people who actually don't know how to properly use a condom. Um, asking the status of their partners. Uh, so knowing your, your partner's status and whether or not they're on prevention, um, also will help. Um, and then really routine uh, three-site testing. So we are seeing a lot of chronic colonization in the oral pharynx, especially of chlamydia and gonorrhea, uh, as well as in the rectum. And then providing PrEP care, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis to those who uh, could benefit from it. And then also talking with them about harm reduction strategies like needle exchange programs, uh, substance use counseling, uh, medication-assisted treatment um, for those who are suffering from addiction. 
So that correct and consistent condom use, I just wanted to address this uh, quickly. Um, so patients can get condoms for free. It's just where do they access those? And my goal would hopefully be to have condoms available in every pharmacy for free, um, but that's uh, part of my advocacy work and, and hopefully we'll get to that point soon. So there's an internal and an external condom. Um, it's been referred to as a male and female condom in the past, but um, really um, because of the fact that the quote unquote female condom can be used as a rectal condom, um, I prefer to call them an external and an internal condom. So um, getting access to these condoms at either low cost or no cost is really important. Um, most public health departments, uh, HIV AIDS advocacy agencies, and then of course Planned Parenthood will all have access to condoms for free. <coughs> uh, also uh, providing needle exchange programs um, and clean needles and then medication assisted treatment and opioid replacement uh, therapy for those who actively have substance use and then increase access to reversal agents such as naloxone, especially in light of our uh, current uh, opioid crisis. So our opioid use disorders, um, we just take a look at uh, this from a harm reduction strategy because poly substance users um, will engage in risky sexual behavior. So we, I know uh, oftentimes uh, we may not see that there's a link between substance use disorders and sexual health or HIV acquisition, but because of the issues with um, not having access to clean needles, um, if they go from opioids to heroin, these things really are uh, related and can be linked. So we are in the midst of an opioid crisis. We are doing um, many things to try to help stave off the crisis, but we are still seeing um, you know, a lot of patients overdosing. So um, as a public health measure, um, all, all pharmacies should be uh, able to provide the reversal agent. So if you take a look here at the graphic at your top right, um, we see that, you know, uh, statutory limitations may be why we're not seeing um, some of these uh, public health interventions going as far as we we think that they should. And this is a billion dollar problem, right? Billion with a B, if we take a look at the graphic there at the, the bottom center of your screen. So when I say harm reduction strategies, really what does that mean? So we want patients to not engage in risky behaviors. And that means identifying all of their potential reasons for why they may be uh, engaging in these behaviors. So counseling is really important, uh, especially if this is coming from a place of, you know, uh, anxiety or depression um, or PTSD because of history of, of prior abuse. And then, you know, if someone doesn't have stable housing or has food insecurity, they are going to use or utilize whatever means possible in order to secure that housing or the ability to get a stable food supply. And that may mean um, engaging in the exchange of sex for money um, or something of value. So um, something else when we think about harm reduction strategies is of course access to uh, both pre and post exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV acquisition. So HIV prevention specifically, um, or PrEP, so there are currently two FDA approved medications on the market, Truvada and Descovy. Specifically, uh, Descovy is, was approved at the beginning of October for MSM and transgender women. Um, studies are um, in the works right now uh, with the FDA um, looking at the potential benefit in cisgender women. Um, uh, this was a non-inferiority trial that was conducted in order to get this medication approved for prevention. And the standards that the FDA set was that it had to have known efficacy in that population, which is why um, only MSM and transgender women were included. 
We also look at um, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, that could be either occupational or non-occupational. So this should be in, instituted within 72 hours of an exposure and includes a full HIV treatment regimen and is taken for a total of 28 days in order to reduce um, and hopefully prevent um, HIV transmission. I just wanted to take a moment to uh, talk a little bit about uh, PrEP care services that are currently being offered in the community and outpatient setting. So uh, there's a few examples here. Uh, Kelly Ross Pharmacy, which is One Step PrEP. Uh, this is a completely pharmacist-run HIV PrEP clinic. Um, they do everything from start to finish, um, and this is through a collaborative practice agreement, which is allowed within the state of Washington. Um, and then the newest program um, that was initiated uh, is part of the University of New Mexico's hospitals outpatient pharmacies, and they are now uh, providing uh, PrEP initiation and monitoring. So um, my tagline that I would like for you guys to take away from this uh, in regards to PrEP care is that PrEP care is not specialty care, it's everybody care, right? So any healthcare provider can, deli can deliver PrEP care. So um, if you have the means to test somebody, um, and especially now that we have fourth generation assays that are just a, a finger stick that you can do in your office, um, that's CLIA waived, you should be able to verify the HIV negative status of the patient and provide them with PrEP um, and additional monitoring. So, um, it's provided for up to 90 days, and you should reassess every 90 days um, in addition to monitoring for things like renal function as well as uh, sexually transmitted infections. So getting involved in PrEP care is really uh, a much needed public health initiative, and I'll talk a little bit about how the federal government is getting involved with this. So um, this is just some information about um, where you can access PrEP resources. Um, you can go to preplocator.org or please prep me. Um, and then we now have a new program that's uh, being uh, implemented by um, Health and Human Services, uh, which is going to be getyourprep.com to allow for those who don't have insurance to access PrEP care for free which leads me to hot off the presses. So this just was released yesterday because um, I want to provide you guys with the most up-to-date information. Ready, set, prep, right? I love this. So it's an expanded access program to help those who are indicated to receive prep services, um, access to care, and hopefully um, take away that financial uh, disincentive um, in order to help them get this medication for free. So let's talk a little bit about some legislative initiatives that have helped to expand pharmacist-led care in public health. So self-administered hormonal contraceptives. So these are protocols that have been implemented across the country, um, allowing for pharmacists to pro provide self-administered hormonal contraceptives. It also allows pharmacists to uh, provide certain contraceptive products in accordance with approved protocols by their state boards of pharmacy. It provides timely self-administered emergency contraception as well as self-administered hormonal contraceptive. And it allows pharmacists to provide comprehensive birth control uh, management uh, for patients who may be uh, having difficulty accessing um, these services. So the definition of self-administered um, uh, includes a few different routes of administration. So oral, transdermal, vaginal, as well as depo injections. And the, the pharmacist will review um, what the best therapy is and counsel the patient on um, the dosage form chosen, the effectiveness, possible side effects, preventative health screenings, safety, um, and then ultimately, um, making sure that they counsel them that hormonal contraceptives do not protect against sexually transmitted diseases. So we, which we should be also incorporating that sexual health assessment 
and talking with them about HIV prevention strategies. So here's an example of a questionnaire. Um, so this is the California State Board of Pharmacies hormonal contraceptive self-screening tool. So it asks several questions in order to um, determine whether or not the pharmacist um, can provide a uh, hormonal contraceptive to the patient based on any contraindications or risks for adverse effects associated with the product. Also, um, something that is new and exciting for pharmacists is the provision of PrEP care without a prescription. So in October of this year, uh, Governor Newsom in California signed legislation um, and it's the first of its kind, um, allowing for a pharmacist to provide PrEP um, and PEP without a prescription. So they, the pharmacist has to complete a training program by the Board of Pharmacy and they have to meet um, criteria based on clinical practice guidelines. Um, so the pharmacist can provide a 30-day up to a 60-day supply of PrEP, uh, but no more than once in a two-year period. So it's not perfect, but it is a start. Um, however, they can furnish PEP care, which is post-exposure prophylaxis, as many times as they would like. But ultimately, if somebody's trying to get PEP, they should be transitioned on to PrEP. All right, so let's talk a little bit about provider status. So currently there are four states that have a advanced pharmacy practice designation. So California has an advanced pharmacy practice license. Montana and North Carolina have a clinical pharmacist practitioner license. And then where I um, did my residency, they have a pharmacist clinician license in New Mexico. So um, obviously each state is different, um, but once this advanced pharmacist practice designation has been obtained, um, this allows for them to, uh, within their scope of practice, do uh, additional um, monitoring, testing, and potentially prescribing, usually within a collaborative practice agreement. Um, and then provider status, gives increased patient access to valuable care. And we know that once we are identified by Medicare, um, we can start billing for some of these services in order to really um, uh, practice at our level and our scope. So when we look at contraceptive legislation, so uh, these are some of the states um, that allow for expanded access to oral contraceptives. Uh, these are just a few examples. This is the most up-to-date map um, from the birth control pharmacist showing where there's been implementation of prescribing of hormonal contraceptives by pharmacists. I feel like Nevada, um, we are sort of in the middle uh, of the California-Utah sandwich, um, and Utah just recently approved this. Um, unfortunately, there was a birth control bill for pharmacists in our legislature for the last legislature. And unfortunately, um, it was not brought up for an, a, a final vote and therefore it, it died in committee. So um, my goal is to get that uh, put back onto the calendar and considered again for our next legislative session. But for our participants, you can take a look and see, um, are you in a state that allows for this? Uh, is implement implementation in progress or are these some of these potential uh, areas for advocacy where you could advocate for some of these legislative changes. I also wanted to take a look at some uh, naloxone and Good Samaritan laws. So depending on where you are located, um, we've got 43 states that currently have standing orders authorizing non-medical personnel to issue naloxone. We've got uh, 34 states allowing um, uh, laws to protect naloxone prescribers from civil and criminal liability. And then we've got 10 states who have Good Samaritan laws to prevent uh, the person who called 911 from arrest for drug possession or drug paraphernalia. And I'm proud to say that Nevada is, we're, we're one, 
all three of these provisions we, we currently are, are allowing. So access to naloxone in community pharmacies. So this was just last updated in January of this year. So you can take a look and see where your state is. So we have standing orders that allow for community pharmacies uh, to uh, provide naloxone to those who need it. Um, and as of right now, we have no states that don't have any kind of either standing order or protocol um, or allow for dispensing without a prescription. All right, so I'm gonna talk a few, uh, talk a couple minutes about some public health resources. So obviously the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is a great resource. Uh, Immunization uh, Action Coalition website is great, immunize.org, uh, Maternal Child Health Coalition, and then um, there is a, a pharmacist group specifically within the American Public Health Association. Um, so they are doing some pretty great work as well. And then I also wanted to just take a moment to say that I personally um, have started a, a resource for public health uh, pharmacists. So it's the publichealthpharmacist.com um, and I'm doing my best to provide resources for those pharmacists who want to provide these types of clinical public health interventions in their communities. So in summary, uh, pharmacists as public health providers can help our communities increase access to care and advance the profession of pharmacy. Traditional pharmacists in public health roles were only thought to be in the U.S. Public Health Services, Indian Health Services as commissioned officers, or the U.S. Federal Bureau of Prisons, but that role is expanding and changing. And we can now look at having those roles expanded in the community pharmacy setting. So advocating for communicable disease management uh, at the community pharmacy setting or partnering with prim primary care clinics can be key to keeping our communities healthy. Caring for vulnerable populations such as the LGBTQ community is a vital role for pharmacists in public health as well as all healthcare providers. Knowing the health disparities, stigma, and discriminations of this population is imperative to providing them with adequate and culturally competent care. And then last but not least, harm reduction strategies are key to decreasing the risk of STDs and HIV acquisition, which include access to condoms, clean needles, pharmacist-led PrEP clinics, and advocating for expanded access across the country. Legislative efforts such as California's expanding um, the need for sexual health assessment and counseling through Senate Bill 159 and self-administered contraceptives um, are really pushing us forward as far as providing these kinds of public health interventions. And then implementing these types of services is something that all community pharmacies and health system pharmacists should consider. And then advocating for communities patients and the profession of pharmacy through the provision of advanced clinical pharmacy services is what we should all strive for in order to have healthy and happy communities and patients. These are my references and I am happy to take any questions at this time. Shanta, I think you have some housekeeping. Actually, let's let's move forward with um, with the questions. I don't know. Um, look at the uh, the chat in the chat feature, and we have questions from two individuals. Oh, all right. Oh, there's lots of questions. Awesome. Okay. And I'll all let right. you on that. Okay. So it looks like. Uh, we have a participant that wanted to mention another really great LGBTQ uh, resource. So this is the Q Card Project. It's a simple communication tool designed to empower LGBTQ youth to become actively engaged in their health and to support uh, the provider who's caring for them. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. 
Um, and I, I definitely want to mention, it looks like there's a couple other people who are, are talking about that resource as well. Oh, okay. Uh, so a question. Can you speak a little bit more about the map for limitations on your opioid response slide? What are challenges with these limitations? Okay, hold on one second. Let me go back to that slide. Okay, so as far as the... You'll have to show your screen again. Oh yeah, sorry, hold on one second. Still getting used to all this tech. <laughs> I just wanna make sure I understand the question correctly. So the question is asking challenges for limitation. So, all right, let me share my screen. Okay, so if we take a look at this, so there's a couple of things that might be limiting individuals, especially in the community pharmacy setting from really maximizing uh, their impact, especially with the opioid crisis. So the standing orders, um, as you can see, there's a majority of, of states that allow for standing orders. Um, but I think the, the limitation here is the liability factor, right? So I think a lot of pharmacists feel like if they're either providing clean needles or if they're providing the reversal agent that they may be condoning or advocating for um, opioid use or um, addiction. But really, again, it goes back to those harm reduction strategies, right? So we're trying to reduce their harm. So if we can stop someone from, you know, utilizing uh, unsafe injection supplies, or if we can help someone to reduce their risk for HIV transmission, or help someone um, from, you know, dying from an overdose because they have a, re a reversal agent. I think that's, that's really what it comes down to. Um, and then really, if you do have a moral uh, or aversion uh, or feel like that's something that you don't personally want to do, I think as a, a healthcare professional, we should at least provide the resources for them to go somewhere else. So even if you don't provide those services, you should at least have access to information of where those individuals can go to access those services. And again, it's state specific uh, in order to, to help with those harm reduction strategies. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think that it's, it's more of a liability issue and then in some cases a moral issue um, for some uh, pharmacists that feel like maybe providing them with these um, interventions may be condoning the, the activity or the behavior, so. And then we have one more question, I believe. Okay. All right. So, all right. So the question, it looks like, why is there not a greater push by retail pharmacists to provide some of the services they provide at the Bureau of Prisons, more specifically testing and treating STDs and UTIs? Both are very common seen treated in ER and significant time and expense to patient and system when pharmacists would be much, uh, much efficient as at doing so. Uh, to answer your question, I completely agree. And I actually just uh, gave a presentation at the California Society of Health System Pharmacists this year at their seminar, talking about the role of pharmacists in providing um, sexual health screenings and um, sexual health prevention strategies in the community pharmacy setting. So I agree with you 100%, and I think that this is definitely an avenue for pharmacists um, that is, is something that could be um, pretty uh, you know, easily implemented 
if there was the will in your area as well as if your corporate policies would allow for it. So um, the only limitation that I could see is, is the testing side. So, you know, um, nowadays you can actually have your patient uh, do self-collected samples. So if that was the case and you could have them do self-collected samples, then you don't even have to, you know, worry about whether or not it's CLIA waived. Um, and you can just have them, you know, do the self-collected sample, send it off to the lab, and then based on those results, you could provide that STD treatment. So I completely agree with you 100%. I think it's really going to, um, you know, be paramount that we try to use some additional community partners like uh, state and county health departments to really kind of increase that access because um, obviously their hours a lot of times are eight to five so that may not be conducive to somebody if they have an STD and it's seven o'clock at night and you know we as the most accessible healthcare professional at the pharmacy setting are really posed to making the biggest um, impact especially when it comes to HIV prevention so I just wanted to take a moment um, to really uh, reiterate sort of the fact that we're really on uh, the precipice of making a huge impact on decreasing the, the HIV epidemic. You know, there's been a renewed interest by the Trump administration to put forth more federal dollars towards uh, HIV prevention strategies and just released yesterday. Um, they were just talking about um, this new program, Ready, Set, Ready, Set, Prep, which is now going to uh, increase access to prep medications for those without insurance so that they can get the medication without um, the cost prohibitive nature of the drug. And so I think it's really going to take all of us um, advocating for it at the local level to hopefully try to start implementing some of these um, some of these more efficient means of treating patients so they don't get a giant ER bill as well as that we're not, um, you know, crowding our emergency departments with things that pharmacists can easily take care of. So I completely agree with you 100% and would be happy to chat with you offline uh, if you would like for uh, me to help you um, wherever you're currently practicing. Well, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was on your mute. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Madison. Um, this was a very beneficial presentation, and I actually learned a lot, and I have notes for myself on how I can assist on the local level and when I am in public health spaces and other healthcare and even um, non-healthcare spaces on, um, on just the role of the public health pharmacist you know, in our community in general, um, whether it's on the state level uh, or um, regional or national. So thank you so much for your time. Um, for everyone that, that, um, that's on the line, you will receive an email with a link to a post-evaluation survey. And we would really appreciate it if you would complete that survey. And again, that survey is also available on our website at causeengagement.com. And just click on the webinars tab scroll all the way to the bottom and the um, survey link is temporarily there. If you are seeking CHES credits, you are required to complete the entire survey. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, can I just make one quick uh, comment? Uh, so I did wanna just, there was one more question that came out um, regarding um, information about uh, LGBTQ and um, sexual orientation and gender identity resources. So uh, I definitely think that um, going to that Fenway Institute resource is really great. Um, the Joint Commission um, has a really uh, great resource um, with their field guide. Um, feel free to send those um, to your administration. Um, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to, to provide you with some additional education. Um, as far as health educators, I think that first and foremost, as somebody who is a former um, you know, president of uh, the Nevada Public Health Association, I see the health educators as a, a indispensable part of this process. So we need you guys to help us 
um, get the word out that pharmacists can provide public health services. Because I think traditionally pharmacists have not been seen in that light. And so that's what we really need from you guys is to think of pharmacists as a public health advocate so that we can support you. But health educators, you guys, I, I could not do what I do without the, the education that you do in the community. So thank you. And, and Shanta knows this. Uh, we worked very closely together. And so that's why I was super excited that we were able to get Ches credit. And um, please feel free to contact me, um, thepublichealthpharmacist.com. Uh, I know that this was only an hour. I could probably talk for many hours on this topic. And I just feel super fortunate that Shanta asked me to come on today. And I just want to thank everyone for participating and being on the call today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes the webinar. Thank you.